um, I don't want my, all right. Yeah, so just so everybody knows, both in the room and on Zoom, that PAC TV is recording this event, and that will be available after the fact. Wonderful. All right, well, we'll get started. Thank you for your patience. We have some lunch here in the room for anyone who didn't catch it on their way in. And um, I have a few slides of information that I wanna go through before we open it up for public comment. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to sort of introduce myself and orient you all to uh, what, we're, what we're doing here. So my name is Caitlin Coyle, and I uh, direct a small research center at UMass Boston in the Gerontology uh, Institute. And our center is called the Center for Social and Demographic Research on Aging. We've been a center for about 10 years, and since that time, we have engaged with about 72 uh, communities, um, helping them engage their population around the issues of aging and put together plans for how communities can adapt to ensure that they remain strong and vibrant places for people to age. We are, uh, we pride ourselves on being dedicated to a collaborative participatory process, meaning we want to hear from you. We, we had this, the wonderful senior task force of which Michelle Brady at the Center for Active Living um, leads and organizes, um, has been sort of our steering committee on this project and has sort of been helping us along the way make sure that what we're doing is relevant, most relevant to, to the town of Plymouth. And um, specifically, we've been asked um, to talk, to, to engage the community around this concept of age and dementia friendly communities, and the town operates the Center for Active Living, which is the count also the Council on Aging, and um, they are seeking to be designated an age and dementia-friendly community. And I'll talk a little bit about what that designation means in a moment. Um, but this, the town has, is supporting this community needs assessment process, of which this forum is one activity. And it is, as I mentioned, being led by the wonderful senior task force of which there are a number of members here in the room. If you're a member of the task force, could you raise your hand? Wonderful, thank you. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful array of stakeholders and, and uh, volunteers in the community who are, who are leading us along this path. Um, and so the needs assessment is, is um, just that, to engage the community around what are their needs and preferences as it relates to being able to age in Plymouth. And the results of this will, uh, will lead to the development of an action plan which will include specific things that the town can do um, to ensure that Plymouth is an age and dementia friendly community. So what else are we doing? We're doing uh, a number of these forums. Uh, so this is actually the second of four community forums that are being uh, facilitated in the community. Uh, we also did a, a survey, a sample survey of residents age 50 plus. So hopefully some of you in the audience received a survey in the mail. Um, we have received um, about 1,700 uh, surveys, uh, close to a 30% response rate, which is really wonderful. And we're in the process of coding all of those surveys right now. And so we're eager, eager to get into that. So that's going to be a wonderful source of data for us. We also sat down with a number of key informants in the community to uh, sort of hear their perspective on what the needs and priorities and of the community um, are and their ideas for solutions. We also will be later, um, after the forums, be uh, facilitating a number of focus groups. And the focus groups are really targeted towards um, what I'll call voices of the community that are not necessarily, they didn't, you know, we didn't hear from them in a forum, we, we may not hear from them from a survey. Uh, one of those groups is folks who are, um, you know, sort of isolated for whatever reason in the community we want to engage, may, maybe not them specifically, but the organizations and the, the, the folks who do um, have contact with them in terms of faith communities and first responders and, um, you know, sort of the front-facing folks in the community to hear about what their, their lived experience in Plymouth is. And also with various resident groups um, so to, to, that have a particular um, commonality to hear from them. So it might be caregivers, it might be people who live in public housing. We're sort of waiting to determine um, the content of those focus groups till we have a chance to look at some of the other data. Uh, we also will be doing a demographic overview of the entire community, not just older adults. 
um, that comes from the American Community Survey, which is a product of the US Census. And then lastly, a document review. So Plymouth has a number of planning initiatives uh, that have recently happened or are in the process of happening. And we are reviewing those documents to ensure that this agent dementia friendly initiative is connected and linked into what else is happening around the community. So the purpose of this is to um, document um, a holistic description of what it means to age in Plymouth and the variety of versions of aging in Plymouth that there are and also to build community awareness and promote collaboration. All of this, as I mentioned, is a foundation for actionable um, initiatives which will come from this initiative. So what we wanna do today is talk a little bit about, uh, explain a little bit more about Agent Dementia Friendly, the model, and get a little bit of demographic information about the community, and then I'm gonna be turning it over to you all um, who are in the room or on the Zoom. And um, it'll be sort of a town hall uh, for, uh, format, uh, and the topics will be th the things that we value about the features of Plymouth as a community when we think about aging. Uh, what are the things that make it challenging, both now and things that concern you about the future as you think about aging in Plymouth? And then ideas for changes or improvements that could make uh, Plymouth a more age or dementia friendly uh, community. So this framework, I keep mentioning age and dementia friendly, I wanna talk a little bit about what that is. So this is a framework that was developed by the WHO in 2006. It was in reaction to the demographic trend of population aging, but also um, some urbanization that's been happening, people moving back to communities and to cities um, to be closer to amenities and, and transportation, and an overall desire to age in communities, so less institutionalization of, of older folks. The WHO said, we wanna put forth some recommendations to communities who are facing this change and the intersection of these changes. So they brought together experts from around the world to develop um, a framework which are really sort of a set, uh, I think of it as a rubric that communities can use to reflect on themselves about where they're doing well and where they have work to do. Um, there's over 1,300 communities in the world who are designated as age-friendly um, currently. And in the US, we have 676 communities who are designated um, as age-friendly. And this definition um, that's shown here is um, from the WHO, and it really says that an age-friendly community is one that's inclusive and accessible, and that it, it's an environment that optimize, optimizes opportunities for health, participation, and security, in order that quality of life and dignity are ensured as people age. So you can imagine you know, that definition, it's about Act, it's about maintaining an active aging process. It's about participating, it's about having health, and it's also about respect and dignity and having people feel that they're included in a community regardless of their age or, um, or their cognitive status. And so the, 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 the rubric includes these eight petals of a flower, which are shown here. And I'm gonna just, it's, I know the slide can be hard to read for those in the room, so I'm gonna just sort of run through them. There's um, elements of the built environment or sort of the systems that are in place helping us uh, access our community. So those include transportation, housing, outdoor spaces, and buildings. It also includes uh, community supports and health services. So that's, so that's not your traditional health services, but also anything that allows people, main, helps them maintain living at home. So it could include Meals on Wheels, it could include home care, it could include, um, you know, uh, family care, giving, anything that helps people sort of stay in their community. It also, this, this framework also includes communication and information, so both about how do people get information about what's available to them in the community, but also what are the channels for information to come from the community back to the municipality. Uh, we have civic engagement and employment, so for people who would like to work or need to work, um, what's available to them as far as employment opportunities as well as opportunities to have a voice in the civic process, and that includes everything from voting to um, being active uh, members of elected you know, boards and, and decision making. It also includes some aspects of social, social aspects of aging, one being respect and social inclusion, and this ties back to that issue of dignity. So is the community a place where regardless of your age, physical or cognitive ability, you feel respected and that you feel included as a member of the community? And also social participation, which is a very broad uh, uh, sort of umbrella term for anything that, that fosters social connection. So that could include formal, 
informal happenings, so things that are going on at the CAL, the Center for Active Living. It can also just mean, um, you know, maybe there's informal neighborhood groups that get together or there's opportunities um, for meetups or, uh, you know, other sort of informal gatherings. But the idea is that sort of using these, this is a rubric thinking about do we have opportunities for social participation and it's not just do they exist for all of these aspects of the community. It's not just about whether they exist or they don't exist. It's about do they exist? Are they affordable? Are they accessible? Are they appropriate um, for the community that lives in Plymouth? So it's not just about do we have housing? It's do we have the kind of housing that we need that aligns with the community that lives here? Is it affordable? Is it accessible? And is it the appropriate kind of housing for people to age in? So really, as we talk today and as I open it up for comment, I want you all to just sort of be thinking about these areas and those sort of A words, <laughs> you know, are, is what we have affordable? Is what we have accessible? Is it, is it appropriate? Is it, um, yeah, and, and also I'll throw awareness in there because I think, um, you know, there's a level of do people use it? Do people know that these things exist and how do they know about that? So I meant, so dementia friendly framework is in this case, um, sort of an overlay to the age-friendly framework. So the idea is that as we're thinking about those eight domains and those A words that I mentioned, are we thinking about them not just for people who are aging, but also for people who are living with dementia and their, their care partners? So the, so the idea here is that as we're doing this work, as the town is dedicated to this work, it's not just about thinking about um, older people as a, a homogenous group, but rather really recognizing that within the older adult population, you have a couple of things happening. One is that there's multiple generations of people in that um, sort of 60 plus age bracket, and they come with a variety of experiences and preferences, but also that there's a wide range of physical and cognitive ability. And so dementia-friendly framework is, uh, is very similar. In this case, it's, as I said, it's sort of an overlay. And it's meant to promote awareness of dementia, educate citizens about how to best support people who are touched by dementia, and introducing systemic changes within businesses, government, and neighborhoods. And that comes from uh, the, uh, uh, an organization called Dementia Friendly Massachusetts. So the idea here is as we're thinking about Plymouth as a community to age, where are we also, how, what are we doing to support people who are living with dementia and or the folks who are caring for them? Because we know that, that those diseases are not um, you know, just for the folks who are diagnosed, but they have a real impact on the whole family. So as I, it applies to all eight domains. It, uh, I will highlight that the, there are two new petals on this flower that you see here um, that are specific to dementia-friendly work, and that is safety. And that can be safety, personal safety in the home. It can be personal safety outside of the home. But in general, um, what are we doing to promote safety for folks who are living with dementia or their care partners? And also care support, at calling it out as a, as a whole, uh, as an additional um, petal of the flower that needs to be addressed in terms of what are we doing to support families who are in that situation and are we ensuring that they have um, opportunities for social connection, for inclusion, uh, for access to employment, all of those age-friendly domains um, are people who provide care, are they being recognized in those ways? So um, that's, the, the, that's the guiding framework that's, that we're talking about and those are the ways that we're trying to hear from the community about those issues. And one of the other sort of rationales to all of this, in addition to the fact that it's um, sort of a public health push to address how our communities are supporting folks as they age, there's also a demographic shift happening, as I mentioned, worldwide, but even more so here in Plymouth. So I wanna just take a minute and, and present some, some data to you all that comes from that American Community Survey that I mentioned. These are estimates from 2021. And in 2021, older adults and the definition of older adults for the purposes of this presentation um, are age 60 and over, and that is what we use here in the United States to, to determine whether or not you're an older American. So for um, older residents uh, in 2021 made up 31% of the population in Plymouth. So you can see 27% of that is folks who are age 60 to 79, and 4% comes uh, from folks who are age 80 or older, and this is approximately 19,000 residents in total. 
We have some projections that are available to us from the UMass Donahue Institute. Projections, I will note, are just that. They are projections. Um, and so we have to, uh, to always take them with a grain of salt. But what we see here is that there's going to be that there is and will continue to be significant growth in the older adult population in Plymouth. So that dark blue chunk of the of the, the chart that you see here is any is the population under age 45. And you see that there is a slow, um, sort of slow decline in that that size that population over time. So what you're looking at here is what the decennial census looked like in 2010. Um, the ACS, the American Community Survey estimates for 2020, because we don't have, we just last week got the um, the age age uh, segregated data from the um, the census. 2020, so those are estimates from ACS, and then 2030 is the projections that UMass Donahue pr uh, produces. So we see a slight decline in the under age 45 group. Um, the orange section is people who are 45 to 59. Again, relatively stable, but a slight decline there, and we see this kind of wild growth in the 60 plus population. So back in, 20, in 2010, it was about uh, one in five, 21% of residents were age 60 and older. As I mentioned in 2021, it was about 31%, and um, it's expected to be 36% by the year 2030. And I think there are, this is not you know, terribly uncommon that, there's a, that, there's a, that the trend in, in population growth is in the older adult population, but I think in Plymouth, it's particularly dr drastic in terms of the, the amount of change. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, obviously, we're living longer as humans. We know more medically, so people are living longer lives, which is great. Um, but we also know that there is the baby boom generation, so just a sheer large size of people who are in these age brackets. And so they are just a large group, and they're living longer, so that's a big part of this. Um, but I think here in Plymouth, the other piece that's happening is you have some in-migration in um, of folks over age 50, um, and that's in large part due to some of the development of housing that's gone on and, and the sort of desire to live in Plymouth as a retirement destination. So I think um, th those things are all part of the story that we want to engage with you about. And before we get into it, I, I also just want to, I mentioned earlier that, you know, when we talk about the, the population age 60 and over, there's at least four, maybe five generations of people who are in that age, age group. And I think it's really important um, for us to reflect on the fact that there's a lot of differences and a lot of diversity within the older adult population, meaning that if you're an older adult in Plymouth, you're an older adult in Plymouth. Um, it's not, um, no one story is the same and everybody has uh, very specific life histories and um, socioeconomic statuses and, and sort of preferences for, for how they live. And so I think I'm just gonna present a couple of data points that I think highlight that diversity that we can keep in mind as we talk about um, aging in Plymouth. So what you see here is from that same data source, the American Community Survey from 2021, and the bar on the bottom of the screen is uh, folks who are age 65 and older who live in Plymouth. It's their median household income. And what you see is that 12% uh, of those age 65 and older li are living under $25,000 a year. And an, an additional 21% are living under $50,000 a year. Now this is income. It does not reflect assets or wealth. So just so you know. Um, but that's compared to the folks who are that 45 to 64 year old age bracket where um, uh, Nine percent are living under that twenty-five thousand dollars a year, and ten percent are living under fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, what I think is interesting, what I, I'd like to just point out about this, so there is definitely um, a bit of a disparity between the older adults and the folks who are forty-five to sixty-four, and a lot of that can be obviously be explained by workforce um, engagement. Folks in forty-five, age sixty-four, are likely still working as are some folks in their, in their late 60s. But, so that's one piece of it. But the other piece is that um, even though there's more folks who are economically or financially insecure age 65 and older, I still think, you know, they still have 36% who are living on $100,000 or more per year. And so I guess I say that um, to highlight there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of so a lot of socioeconomic diversity in the community. It's not, you know, in some communities where I do this work, I go in and it's this. Oops, this graph looks a lot different, and it looks like um, the, the disparities uh, for older people financially are much more sort of clear and drastic. I think here in Plymouth, you have a little bit more of a distribution in terms of that. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, we also this is some information about disability status. So this is about physical disability. 
Um, the pie chart that you see here uh, tells us that about 24% of the population age 65 has at least one physical disability, if not multiple um, physical disabilities. And this can include things like being able to walk upstairs, um, walk long distances, get up from a, ch a seated position, sort of that very functional aspect of disability. So when we think about how do people participate in our community, how do they feel included, how are they um, getting in and around town, um, thinking about this piece I think is, is important. And also we have some data that I frankly think are pretty old. Um, they come from 2010, I believe that have um, that 11% of uh, Plymouth's residents age 65 or older are living with dementia. That's based on diagnosis. And so what we know about dementia is that a lot of people go without a diagnosis um, for a period of time or if not the entirety of the, the disease. So I'm, I, my prediction is that that's relatively low, but it is something, it's, it's what we have. Um, so, so among the physical disability, we also have, um, I think, a, probably a rising rate uh, of dementia. So, so that's my sort of spiel in terms of what we're doing here, why we're doing it, and what we are hoping to learn. And so in this next portion of the um, event, we will be turning it over to you all for public comment. And there's a couple of ways to do that. And I know we have um, some folks on the Zoom as well. You all have a note, the folks in the room have a note card on their chair. And if you, for whatever reason, don't feel comfortable raising your hand or you have something that comes to mind as we're talking, you're welcome to write that comment or question on that note card and leave it behind and we will collect it and include it as part of um, the feedback that we received today. You can also just use it to take notes <laughs> if, if you like, but that's, that's the purpose of the note card. Um, the other uh, way to ask uh, questions for, for people who are here in the room is to raise your hand and I will call on you. We only have one microphone. So I'm going to um, listen to your comment or question and then I'm gonna repeat it into the microphone so that it's recorded and that folks on the Zoom and on the recording can understand um, the dialogue. So um, folks on the Zoom, which I believe we just have uh, Janice. Um, Janice, if you would like to, <laughs> thank you for waving. If you have a comment or a question, I'll give a pause after each section um, to see what you have to say. You can either put things in the chat or you can um, you know, raise your hand. We can all hear you here in the Zoom, or in the room. Okay, great, thank you. Kate. You're welcome. Does anybody have any questions before about the process that I've laid out, in terms of what the town is doing, anything like that before we get started with, with your feedback? Uh, yeah. Oh. Okay. I'm going to stick with my plan. Thank you. That sounds like too much risk for, for danger. Um, yeah, so any questions about what we're doing here, what, what we're hoping to learn? Okay. Can I start with a comment? Absolutely, Michelle. Thank you. See what I said about danger? Do you think so? Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, contrary to popular belief about what age and dementia friendly, it is absolutely aging in our community. But it's families that are aging with small children that want to stay here but maybe can't afford to. What's the school system like? Maybe you have children or grandchildren in the community that you're worried about or not even worried, but want to know what Plymouth looks like in the future. Maybe you are an elder. Maybe you're a caregiver. Maybe you just think the town needs something different. So when we see the word age, it's not necessarily older or elder. It's about where we are now, where you are now, and the people you care about, where you want them to be. Can you afford, literally, figuratively, in every other way, to maintain in your community? Can you afford to not maintain in your community? So some of these questions that we're opening up, dementia, predominantly 
sure, may affect elder adults predominantly. But for anybody that's encountered dementia, and everyone in this room probably knows someone, your, your worry, your stress, your caregiving, your support affects you immensely. So it's not an older disease. <laughs> you know, it's a family disease, it's a community disease. It's absolutely everything that impacts you. We don't wanna make assumptions about what impacts you or what's important to you. That's the purpose. Right? I don't want to stand here as Director of Elder Affairs and say, I speak for all seniors, I know what they want. No, I don't. Not until you tell me. So that's really what we want to look at across the spectrum for our town. I just wanted to make that really clear and not lecture. But, <laughs> but please, make this open, engaging, and, and talk. Just, just chat. Yeah. We'll start with Lee Hartman as a question. Oh, OK. I was just going to say thank you to Michelle for that context. <laughs> for the context, because I think it's an important point about this idea, you know, one of the premises of this whole framework is that if we create in communities where people can thrive as they age, we're creating spaces where people can thrive, period. A community that's good for older people is a community that's good for, for humans in general. And also, um, she highlighted another point that I wanted to, to raise, which is this idea that you all are here, I think, because you're residents of Plymouth, but I also know that you may wear uh, multiple hats. So you may be um, a resident, you may be a grandparent, you may be a volunteer on a board or a committee, and I invite you to speak from any of those places, and everything is on the table, so um, you're also welcome to think about what you see in your neighborhoods and communities, your neighbors, your friends, the people you know, what you're hearing at cocktail parties, um, you know, what are the issues that you're, you're, um, you're aware of in the community. So. Lee, did you actually have a question, or did you just get put on the spot? Yeah, I got put on the spot. So okay. I actually just I have, right have a comment. Lee sure. Hartman, I'm actually also the Director of Planning and Development for the town. I would just point out as I listen to this, Plymouth has another challenge, unlike many other communities, at 103 square miles, we're the largest community. If you live in Buttermilk Bay, or if you live down on Bourne Road, or even maybe on the outskirts of Federal Furnace Road, getting to services or having services supplied to you are a real challenge. So I think unlike other communities, and this goes for almost every service we provide, I think we have to keep in mind that we have um, a large geographic area and challenges with commuting or providing services to some of those areas. And I'm not even talking about the people who might live on Sequish or at the end of Long Beach, which would also be another challenge. Yes, thank you, Lee. Yeah, another great contextual point before we get into, the, you know, is this idea that Plymouth has a geography issue, which is that it's sort of disparate um, in terms of, uh, you know, connectivity and also just size. Um, and that's an important thing to think about as we think about how do we support people aging in the community. So now that we have a, a free microphone, <laughs> um, Beth, do you want to work on um, helping folks um, access the microphone? I'm gonna, we're gonna start on a positive note, um, which is talking about what you think of as the strengths of Plymouth as a place to age. So what are the good things about aging in Plymouth? And again, just sort of raise your hand and Beth can bring you the microphone. Oh, look, there are none. Ah, that's not true. All right, up here we've got one. Thank you. Thank you. Our <laughs> Um, so, and my wife sitting next to me and I are both residents of Pine Hills. Big senior population there. Um, and I think one of the advantages in Plymouth for the senior population is there's really a lot of opportunities for volunteer service. And I think that enormously helps people who are getting older, it gives them a social connection, gives them a feeling of purpose um, in their lives. and. I certainly have taken advantage of that a lot. <laughs> um, I don't know if you just heard my... <laughs> from, your, uh, from your wife there. Um, you know, and the, there's other things that are going on here in Plymouth as well that a lot of people aren't aware of yet. Karen and I work together extremely closely. Uh, we have ever since we first arrived in Plymouth about five, almost six years ago now. Um, I'm a retired college professor. My wife's are retired from um, education as well. And so we looked around and said, well, what can we do? Um, and the first thing we ended up doing, or one of the first things, was volunteering at a food pantry. And certainly 
seeing that going on and seeing the variety of people that were coming in who were food insecure, kind of was an eye opener because we had never been there before. We'd never experienced so closely with people that were in that position. Um, and it was surprising actually the number of senior citizens that had to avail themselves um, of the food pantry services. And we kept encouraging people, you know, please tell your friends, because a lot of people were reluctant to take advantage of that opportunity. And so things have mushroomed um, for us. And I'm busier now, I think, than I was when I was a full-time college professor. Uh, then some. Um, so there's a lot more to say, but that's an answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And there's a lot in there in terms of what you said, I, and I'm just going to try to repeat a couple of those things. One is the, um, op the volunteer opportunities that exist in Plymouth, that that's a, that's a strength, and that's a strength because it not only keeps people sort of active in their in their aging process, but also this it connects them socially to other, other residents, and it also... Um, helps raise awareness about what is available and what some of the issues are going on in the community, sort of kind of keeps you connected in that way. Um, and you also highlighted food security, <laughs> food insecurity, which I think is a, we'll get to the challenges in a, in a, in a few minutes, but I think that's something that um, we don't always think about, um, at the special, for those of us who, who haven't been in that situation, but it is something that affects seniors, but also everyone. There's a lot of families in that situation too. So uh, food access is huge. Thank you. Other strengths of living and aging in Plymouth over here. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we're, my wife Faith, and I'm, my name's Ed McAdams. Uh, we're relatively new to Plymouth. And if some of the strengths, the reasons that brought us here, one of them was proximity to the ocean for one, obviously. Uh, but what we found is there's a lot of extras, like uh, shows, at the spire or at the memorial hall, things like that. There's um, good, good little restaurants and things like that. But one of the things that really struck us is Cal. Uh, we, I never pictured myself going to a place like that. I have to say, I'm a little bit of a snob, I guess. But I never pictured using a place. In the town we lived in, it was kind of way off in the background. And we, we've taken, uh, I don't know how many courses at you met at uh, Bridgewater State. I mean, I look forward to it. We're not in class now. I was taking like seven classes just because it's so much fun to just sit there, professor, and not have to study, read, you know, do anything extra. So to me, it, those are, are pluses. The, the thing that I'd like to figure out is we still haven't been able to find out how to get the information. The, the website for the town has changed, and it's outstanding. But there's still, like even trying to find out about this, if we didn't know Christine, we wouldn't have known. And, and so somehow that, that piece would be a, a big help, I think, to help people you know, come in and feel they're more a part of it. And we're you know, way down in the other end of town. So it's, it is a, you know, a kind of a drawback. I mean, the geographic area of this place is mind blowing when you first move here, because it's a half hour from one side of town to the other. Where I lived, that would be two towns. So it's this, there's a lot of stumbling blocks, but I think it has, those also could be you know, assets as well. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think, um, again, lots of points in there, one being this sort of extras piece that you talked about, you know, the restaurants, the shows. I, somebody earlier before we started was talking about, I don't have to leave Plymouth you know, to, to do those kinds of things. Um, and also the Cal, obviously, is a huge asset um, to, to living in the community and access to Bridgewater State, the lifelong learning aspects of that, too. So lots of sort of assets in and around Plymouth. Um, great points. Thank you. Yes, up here, Beth. Oh, here. Stripes. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Jan Blanchard. Um, I think one of the great assets we have in town is the library. Um, I don't have to really leave home to access the library catalog. I can I can look through there and and um, pick out what I want and then just one trip to the library and get it. And I, I think there's also other services for seniors that I probably don't take advantage of. But the library is really a great asset. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, not just for, for getting books, but there's other, other programs and things. And, and I think going back to the previous point about information, you know, sort of a place to, to learn about what's going on in the community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christine Silva. <clears throat> I live in downtown Plymouth. Um, I'm a real estate broker here in town for 30 years. And I'm glad Lee came back. 
so one of, the th one of the things I hear all the time from my seniors, my clients, is that either my, their children can't stay in town, they can't afford to stay here, and my seniors live around me, I'm senior too, but they, the tax burden is beyond. And I know our tax base, we have so many seniors, to give the seniors a break is probably impossible, I'm gathering. But what we need so badly is zoning reform. We need to be able to ha build accessible dwelling units. We, I need to be able to, if my home is big, let my son move in and take care of me. Let me have my own little unit. I don't understand why this town cannot get beyond that. Yeah. Thank you. No, huge challenge. The, pro the, the, the affordability of taxes, the issues around housing and zoning, and I think ultimately the, the limitations put on families to stay in the same community and what that does over time to the fabric of a community is something I think that's also sort of embedded in what you've said. So thank you for that. I'm gonna kind of keep us on strengths if we can, but I know we'll get to the challenges next. Yes. Uh, David Peck, uh, a new member of the planning board, but I've uh, been around uh, also on building committee. Uh, open space and trails. Uh, I will say, you know, th this town, you know, has a lot of uh, town-owned properties and great trails, but also Wildlands Trust, uh, mm -hmm. the Audubon Society and Tidmarsh. That's a terrific resource that I think is, uh, uh, kind of uh, under-marketed to remind people there's just you know, wonderful things. I'd also say on accessory dwelling units, uh, I have tried twice and town meeting uh, did not approve it, but hopefully thir th third time's the charm because it absolutely is one of the multiple things we need to do to make things more affordable for everybody, but also certainly for the seniors so that they can stay in their homes. Yeah, absolutely, and, and and another push for a pull or you know plug for the outdoor spaces. You know, we talked about access to the ocean. You're talking about the the the, the trails, the the conservation land, all of those um, outdoor amenities, which make Plymouth a good place to to be and to be active. Thank you. Any other things you love about live you you love about living in Plymouth that make it a good place to age? Before we move on to challenges. One thing I'd point out. Is oh, thanks, the Janice. <laughs> of the ability for shopping, for example. I mean, just 10 years ago, so many of these stores and um, markets just didn't exist and now they do. So we were talking about not leaving, needing to leave Plymouth because of all the cu cultural aspects, but also for, you know, buying groceries, et cetera. So I think that's, that's a positive as well. Yes, the access to being able to buy the things you need to, to get by right here in town is really a valuable value. So I am aging in Plymouth. I live in Plymouth, and that's the truth. What I love about Plymouth is, I think, the support of small businesses, our chamber, and the way that the town, I work for the town, and I'm a fairly new employee. Listen, there's all kinds of dirt we can talk about the town. Positives, though. <laughs> It's a, everyone works together. It's true. The senior task force coming together, the, the community partnerships that happen in this town on the professional level, boards, committees, you can agree, disagree all you want, but there is so much care and passion for caring about this town, and it's evident even in the wildest of arguments. It's evident. Yeah. So I think the community itself is really well woven and we really have a supportive nature. Yeah. Yes, and if the senior task force is, is evidence of, of the kinds of things that happen, then I can completely attest to that <laughs> in terms of the uh, willingness to collaborate and the dedication to the community. Okay, well, we're gonna shift gears to, um, in your experience, um, what would you describe as the challenges for adults aging in Plymouth? Again, for yourself, for your family, your neighbors. And it could be now, things that are challenging now, and they can be things that you think about as being challenges in the future, things you're concerned about as you think about staying, staying in the community. Yes, up front here. Oh. We'll get you a microphone. Sorry, just for the record. <laughs> The largeness of the municipality of Plymouth is um, 
the lack of transportation. Um, where we live in Pine Hills, if you don't drive, you're stuck, unless you want to call an Uber or whatever to, to drive you. Um, you know, unless you live actually in the town of Plymouth, in the downtown, there really is nothing. Yeah, yep. And, and that's a big concern. Yes. So the, going back to the, the vastness of the geography and the way it's sort of uh, parsed apart, this issue of transportation is serious in the sense, I mean, it's, it's serious no matter what community you're in, but here in Plymouth, I think it makes the solutions a little bit more challenging to think about how do we connect people with transportation um, to get them where they need to go and, um, yeah, thank you. Transportation is huge. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kevin Hood. I am on the senior task force. I'm a local builder in town. It is something that is coming up on our senior task force that is a big concern for us is the geography of this town. We understand that it's very widespread, unlike any other town anywhere east of the Mississippi, actually. It is something that we're going to be addressing. The Gatra bus can only hit so many places, and it is the biggest concern. The benefit that you have being in the Pine Hills is that they've set up communities and services there that people that are on South Plymouth don't really have unless you are in Redbrook. But it is something that we're concerned about. It is something we are addressing, and it's a big concern. If we could get a more elaborate system that's cost affordable to get people around this town with the amount of uh, conveniences that we have in this town, you can go over to Conley Place and there's nothing. You don't have to leave this town, and that's what we want. We want people to be able to go there, have the services, go to a local restaurant, keep it local, and it will serve everybody's needs. But that geography is a big concern right now, but we are addressing that as this develops. Thank you. Yeah, and I think it also, your comments reminded me too of this idea, transportation is part of the solution, but also thinking about how do we dis deliver services in, you know, go to the people <laughs> as opposed to requiring the people to come um, to, you know, a particular place. And, and I think a combination of those kinds of solutions might, might be helpful too. Thank you. Ed McAdams again. Uh, the thing that probably would have been most helpful for us when we moved in, and I think it would probably be for even people that have been here for a while, is one consolidated way of giving information to the person that, uh, as to what is available. Uh, we've kind of hunted around and found all the resources, but if there were, you know, there used, I, there used to be a thing, welcome wagon, do you remember that? Yeah, I don't even know if that ever, does it still exist? In my town, there's one. I don't know about yeah, Plymouth, but... But maybe something like that, so that even the people that are here that maybe are older or struggling a bit, deliver something to them so that, and help them understand how to reach out to these. A little education might be a, a good way to address some of that. If it, if it exists, uh, I apologize, but I didn't experience it. If it exists and you don't know about it, then it's That's not doing, right. <laughs> doing you much good. Um, <laughs> but I think that issue of communication about what's, what's available is huge and having a central location for it. Um, it's great, yeah. Um, when I first moved to Plymouth, I learned a lot from the local newspaper. And at this point, we basically have no newspaper, um, which is a huge challenge, I think, to people learning about what's going on because a lot of elders don't want to use the internet. Um, they're not savvy. Um, they don't, some don't have the internet. And um, a, a good local newspaper would be fabulous. I think that's a great point, and it's this. Idea, I think one of the things I think about is even those of us who are tech savvy, inundated with emails and junk and ads and all these things that I don't even notice when I get an announcement that means something sometimes. And so I, somebody mentioned they wouldn't have known about this event if it hadn't been for someone they knew, a word of mouth. And so I think it also just reminds me of the value of sort of the old school ways of getting information: word of mouth, newspaper, sort of print media. Um, and it's not just about older folks don't use the internet. It's a little bit of you know we're all a little overwhelmed <laughs> with with the amount of internet flying at our flying at us all the time. So thank you. Yes. Oh, I. Um, go ahead. Is that me? Okay. <laughs> um, maybe Lee knows, but I I've overheard that this town needs a mental health facility, whether it's treating dementia dementia or even for our young people. How do we get a mental health facility in this town? Help, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, you know, I mean, I'll just speak from the broader perspective of that, which is that, you know, mental health beds are needed everywhere. 
not just here in Plymouth, but everywhere. It's, and so I think um, one way to think about that is, you know, if we can't get it in Plymouth, how can we get it, how can we get our folks connected to other, you know, communities that are doing things, or how can we work together with other communities? I know some of the hospital folks are working on a lot on those issues as well, but I'm... We have a great facility at Plymouth, but just at the same time, the water issue popped up. Mm. No, there's no water problem. So the issue is, if in the win in the winter, in now the problem is in the summertime. If a well goes down during a drought and there's a fire, we don't have the capacity for the fire. Day to day, there's not a water issue. It's that safety. And if you say that'll never happen, I'll guarantee you it happens. So the issue is that re redundancy. We're right now in the process of building a booster station or designing and building one that will connect the North Plymouth water system to the West Plymouth, which will allow those things to move forward. But again, this popped up just at the same time that that facility was looking to come to Plymouth, and again, they're, they're going somewhere else. I, I was gonna point out for the asset too, so my time here, which is now 35 years, the medical facilities and the quality of medical care and the number of options you have in Plymouth have really expanded and is constantly expanding also. So that's something else that we have and that might be because of the population. You know, they came here because we're here or, you know, but again, there is quite a few opportunities all over this community for that type of care. And some of them are in these smaller, you know, Red Brook or Pine Hills. You have them not just simply in areas that you have to drive to. Some of those are in the community. Um, can, can I just say uh, one opportunity or, or issue that I see all the time is housing affordability in general with the prices going up as rapidly as they are. For example, in two years, our rent went up by 30%, and I'm talking about per month, and it, it's just huge. And also the costs are rising for um, for example, if you do need assisted living or that kind of thing, the costs are prohibitive for people to afford. So that I see as a major issue going forward. You're off. Um. People who rent are experiencing rising costs. People who own homes are experiencing rising costs. And anybody who wants to come in to Plymouth is facing high costs. Um, so I think all around that that's a, that's a huge issue. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Lee just stepped out, but um, mm -hmm. finding, you know, just confirming the time and the place for this meeting, because I had a sense it was at Town Hall, so I went online this morning on the town's website and it was not listed as a meeting. Uh, I called Lee and he said, oh yeah, you know, great hall. So that's just another reinforcement, it would be great to have m much more information available on the website. Uh, a second thing I'd point out, and uh, Jan is uh, equally a friend, uh, 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 Pine Hills, a couple of ours left Pine Hills uh, maybe about half a year ago to uh, go to an independent living facility uh, in a different town that had independent living and then either same building or same campus, assisted living, and a memory care unit. So, uh, you know, I, I know we've got, you know, final Redbrook, there's lots of good places, but, you know, following up on that suggestion, memory care units are probably in cult our society's future, and it would be great to have one here or more, as big as we are. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, highlighting the point that um, things change. People, you know, people, you know, uh, the onset of something like dementia can really change the the trajectory of people and what they need, and and being able to support people along that continuum and have options for them is huge. Yes. Hi, I'm <clears throat> Kathy Castagna, and I'm with the Plymouth Senior Fa Class Force, and I'm on the advisory committee for the Cal. Um, I live in Plymouth. I've been here for 40 years, and I have an old house, and I live downtown, and it's lovely. So there's a lot of things that I'm, I have accessibility to. However, my husband and I are aging, and we used to be, we're great do-it-yourselfers, but we're at the point where we can't do it ourselves anymore. So it's the idea of finding 
legitimate businesses, construction folks, painters, electricians, plumbers, all that, you know, how do you, how do you find the, the services that are reliable and that are affordable for the senior population to keep their homes and to age in place? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, when we link that with the housing issue, if people have nowhere to go, then the default is they stay where they are, and sometimes that can mean they have to make adjustments to their home um, to be able to stay there, and obviously, um, homes age too, and so the act, you know, being able to support people with repairs and modifications is in need, and I think the other need you're pointing to is um, how do we find out about what's available to us in terms of identifying contractors that are trustworthy, that are um, affordable, that understand, won't try to upsell um, people and things of that nature. So great points. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just want to point out because I, we worked really hard to get this on the face page of the new town website, and it is. It is. It's under newsflash. So there's there's four sections on the face page of the new town website, and it lists featured newsflash or timely or worthy events going on or, or information, and it does say community forums. But I will work with, I feel bad because Anthony Sinesi from our town manager's office worked very hard to make sure that this was one of those face-facing face events. Um, but it goes to communication, right? We need to make sure we're constantly working on that and having one stream. I also will just say in some of the comments here, from the senior perspective, it's very interesting because we began with a grant because of COVID and retirement, the Welcome Wagon 2.0 at Cal. So what we did is we've started this quarterly, exactly what you're talking about for seniors, um, and we actually have postcards going out to every senior um, who's voted, who registered, voted, and has moved here in the last six months to one year. That's upcoming. And it's exactly that. We have people from the chamber, from the cultural component, from our town government, ask us questions. Where do I get a beach sticker? Where's the best restaurant? Where, what senior services are available? So we're starting that in the senior sector, but I don't see any reason why we can't broaden that town-wide. Also, when it comes to mental health, same thing. We recognize mental health is an issue. We can't bring a facility here, but we have partnered with Bridgewater State University's master's program for social work, and we are now in the fall gonna be offering on-site, in-person clinical services to any senior in Plymouth free of charge. So these are the things, though, that need to get out, right? We got a grant. It's all grant-based, but, you know, right grant shall have. But um, so these are things that you all should know about, whether you're a senior or not. Again, if you have a parent, a sister, an aunt, anyone that you want these services for those in Plymouth, I just want to make sure you're aware of those. I think that's a great point, and I want to highlight just one, one aspect of that, which is this idea that there is a lot happening at the Cal, and and... I think sometimes when we talk about communication, one of the things that deters people are words like age, aging, dementia, elderly. <laughs> you know, we live in a society that doesn't like to get old. And so um, when we think about communication and information, maybe one possible solution is to think about how do we message what's happening at Cal or happening with this initiative in ways that's appealing and attractive um, to folks who may be a little shy around those words. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Yes. I like that. I like that. Uh, Karen Peterson, I work uh, at BID Plymouth, and um, I'd, I'd say the biggest challenge that we're uh, dealing with right now is staffing. Um, we really are have been hurt quite a bit through COVID, uh, especially in healthcare. And you know, you brought up mental health, and I think a lot of the problems with mental health is that we just don't have as many people. Um, in the field, and I think that's happening everywhere. Um, but I know we're we're doing our best to try and recruit good people, and and I know that the state is doing their best by having these uh, community behavioral health centers. Uh, but it's going to take some time and um, some creativity, similar to what Michelle's doing, um, and and a lot of it is communication. But definitely, I'd say from a challenge standpoint, uh, staffing is is big for us. Hi, Barry Potvin again. Um, 
just wanted to mention something that we found very helpful when we first moved into the Pine Hills community. There were established already welcome sort of seminars that were made available to any new residents of the Pine Hills, and they gave out vast amounts of information, um, you know, free coupons for various things with local businesses. So that was obviously a big help when you move into a new community and you don't know where things are, and a lot of word word by mouth happens. So if we need a contractor, we can send out messages to the Pine Hills community and we get multiple sort of replies about, oh, you should try this company or that company for various other, other things. I agree with everybody. We need more community outreach. We really do. I think Cal is doing a great job at trying to do it. The Board of Health is in the process of organizing um, community forums and information sort of sources on a regular basis about health-related issues. And we also now have, and Karen and I both work together on this, a six-community state-funded uh, grant group that actually um, has been in, in effect for about six or nine months now. Um, the state has been very generous with financial support. We are providing an epidemiologist a public health social worker, a public health nurse, and a public, and also a specialist who's knowledgeable about environmental health risks. They will also be engaged in these community outreach seminars and forums. Um, and we'll, as as I guess you know, Michelle knows, we do try to reach out and sort of network information together. Uh, the problem is really getting the knowledge out to the community that this is happening. We want you to come. Um, if you have time, please do so. That's really the stumbling block. Yeah, and I, I think you know your, the the example of Pine Hills, where you have sort of you know that kind of instant feedback loop of your neighbors and in all of that. You know, thinking about how could we replicate that or use what you're you know that model in other places, people that you know where they don't live in Pine Hills. You know, in terms of if local neighborhoods, local areas. You know, sort of that word of mouth. Um, you know, sort of neighborhood um, association kinds of things. Um, and also, um, I think overall the community engagement is something that requires ongoing effort as you're talking, you know, sort of periodic um, education and also, you know, sort of the connection of not just, you know, education, but sort of how um, people can be involved, right? So it's about the, getting the information out over and over and over again to new people, to people who've been here and that kind of thing, but also... Um, to identify it, ways that people can contribute to that. We, you know, sort of we want to build the network, right, in terms of the kinds of people like, like you who are, out, who are doing things and involved in volunteering. Um, and word of mouth is a really powerful way of doing that. Everyone loves to be invited. <laughs> Other challenges, things you... Th you think about as you age in Plymouth that we haven't touched upon yet? Um, eventually, I'd like to see um, neighborhoods that are walkable. You can, you can walk to a little grocery store, a market. You could walk to a pharmacy um, so that when we can't drive anymore, we're, we're able to access um, what we need from home. But I see that as something that far in the future, you know, before that's ready. I also wanted to say that I think that, um, are you familiar with Age in Place Villages? So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think they're doing that all over the country right now. And I think even as big as Plymouth is, we could organize it by precinct or by village, you know, with spokes where you could get the information out that way. And it's a great use of volunteers. Yeah, it's a wonderful model, the village um, village model that started right here in, in, in Massachusetts and is now global, um, really, which is, for those of you who aren't familiar, is sort of a, uh, it actually came out of this phenomenon of, natu they, called nat they called them naturally occurring retirement communities, which was really just sort of pockets of places where there happened to be a lot of folks who were aging in place, and they started sort of um, helping each other out, sort of informally, sort of peer to peer, giving rides to, gro to the hospital, to doctor's appointments, picking up groceries, prescriptions, um, you know, I'm going to have surgery on this day, could you help, you know, 
get me ready for that or give me a ride or whatever. And so now there's sort of a more formal version of that, which is this villages model. And they and it has turned also into not just sort of peer to peer help, but also lots of social programming, lots of enrichment, lots of, you know, going out to dinner, watching, having, going films, trips, <laughs> all kinds of things. And so it is a really lovely model that um, relies in almost entirely on its volunteer base. And I think you're right that it could go, do very well here. Yeah. <laughs> Better late than never, I guess. All right. Well, I'm, I'm shifting us a little bit to um, the last part, portion of our conversation, which is about ideas for how we can sort of build on our strengths to address these challenges, sort of what are some ideas for how we can make improvements. We've already talked about a number of them. and. Um, I want to just sort of put it out there again. I think one way to think about this is if you, if you know, political will and and money wasn't uh, weren't issues, you know, what could you imagine, um, Plymouth? That you know, we have this idea of walkable villages, you know, places, you know, city, you know, sort of little town centers where you can access um, a cup of coffee and a, a loaf of bread, kind of thing, in walking distance. Um, other ideas or recommendations? Yeah. I've been working with Harry Helm and Steve Bulletin, and I'm hoping that we can create some uh, land banks so that we can create those living, those centers or the uh, commune for, you know what I mean, with green space in the middle and for seniors and activities. Um, I hope we can get through that and achieve that. That's great. Janice, do you have any anything to say on Zoom here? I think that's really a good idea. And one of the things, again, that we want is to make sure that these things are affordable when they do come and are implemented. Yep. Mm -hmm. Kathy, back to you. Just a thought on the housing front. I know we talked about the, the need for um, reform for zoning for accessible dwelling units, but what about the idea of you know having tiny houses in our yards? I have a huge backyard even though I live in downtown, and it would be great if I could park a tiny house back there and I could move there and I could give my house to one of the kids. <laughs> so that's a whole issue. You know, We don't need as much space as we grow older. We just really need things that are more compact and accessible, but that's a whole issue about zoning and planning, but it is something we can think about. Yeah, absolutely. The tiny home type of, of living is, is not, you know, I think appealing for folks who are aging in place, but also for young people who are, you know, trying to get started and off their feet, and a small, a small dwelling can be a way to do that too. So it can, again, sort of serve uh, multiple ages. Yes. I would like to just second that um, in terms of senior living, not in a high rise, but in a, a one story little tiny house. Um, the thought of moving to a high rise is not very attractive. <laughs> so uh, practical and attractive, the idea, yeah. I'm gonna change the topic slightly and ask a question uh, to Michelle and maybe everybody here. When the uh, Council on Aging was built next to Plymouth North, uh, part of the planning back in 2012 and before 2012 is by putting, it becomes a multi-generational set of relationships that the kids can meet the seniors, can, you know, they can each teach others and stuff. And so I don't know how much that vision has been played out, but it certainly could be a vision for the future as well that, uh, you know, you know, let's involve the high school kids and maybe nearby college kids with the seniors programmatically learn from each other and it just would enrich things. Uh, and certainly the physical planning, that was the goal when Council on Aging and the high school were built in the same place at the same time. I'm gonna let Michelle answer that, but, but I just wanna highlight this, um, the opportunity, you know, of uh, multi-generational engagement 
in general, you know, whether that's at the Cal or just in the community more broadly, how do we think about, I think the other, you know, sort of American um, way of doing things is this sort of age segregation. We've got kids, we've got um, empty nesters, and we've got uh, older adults. And for some reason, our, our systems are set up that they're separated and all of that, but that we know that there's a lot of enriching um, experiences that can happen when we bring them to. So anyways, so thinking about, you know, age and dementia friendly Plymouth as this opportunity for age integration and how do we think about, let's not call it a senior event, let's call it a community event. And we encourage people of all ages to come. So I'm going to turn it over to Michelle to answer your question. Uh, Mr. Peck, of course. No. Mr. Peck was going to build for us our time capsule right before COVID, which was intergenerational. So I loved that. We, we had a lot of good ideas. Um, but to answer your question, I think that we've done a pretty good job of creating programming, being next door, right up till COVID, and I hate using COVID as a, but it shut everything down, right? It really did. Um, we've brought back most of what we started, but there's still a disconnect. That's the truth. Um, I think as we look, I say globally, more community-wide, you know, what do I envision, to your point? You know, pickleball courts that aren't isolated somewhere, because that's what seniors do. Pickleball courts with a playground, with a community center, with where people aren't sit, saying, oh, the seniors are over there, and the kids are over there. We try to get, we work with the Poet Laureate, we do poetry workshops with seniors and seniors, right? But in a perfect community, I would have those parks. You know what those parks have to have? Benches with a handle in the middle. Because if you look at our benches, there's on one end, there's a handle, and on the other end. If you have mobility issues, and I don't mean you're 100, and can't, if you have mobility issues, if you have a broken leg as a 30-year-old, and you want to sit on the park bench, seniors are playing pickleball, you know, the kids are playing on the playground, the grandparents are interacting with, with you know, the kid, try to lift yourself up off a bench with one arm. You need two handles. We need to just grow a community. We have a great community. All those walking trails, there's no handrails. Just think about the simple things. We want to take our community. You know I love the purple table. This involves intergenerational. We have kids in the summer, right, who are waiters, waitresses. Imagine because it's free of charge, that we provide training to wait staff at all of our gorgeous, awesome restaurants about dementia. It's called the Purple Table. Imagine you call up to make a reservation, and you say, I'd like to reserve the Purple Table. And that 18-year-old or 16-year-old who's a hostess knows exactly what you're talking about, and they know that that table is a little bit further away from the crowds is a little less congested, maybe has some signage. Signage is huge for dementia. Imagine if we just lived in a community where we made that call and you knew you were taking mom out tonight and she was going to her favorite restaurant and you didn't have the stress. And that 17-year-old who's waiting on you has had some basic training that came over and engaged with your mom. Imagine that. Those are the things that are gonna change Plymouth and make it great. That's what age and dementia friendly is all about. So that's what I see in the future. Hope that answered. Well question. said, Michelle. Wow. Karen. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, you brought up walkability and I know transportation's come up. Uh, potentially looking at like a complete streets model. I know a lot of communities have looked at that. So just kind of wanted to throw that out. Okay. Walkability, connectivity, sidewalks, crossing walk, crosswalks, all of that, yep. Yeah. Back to the uh, topic about intergenerational. Everyone should know that one of the newer things we put in place at the Board of Health was actually having student representatives from the high schools on our Board of Health. Um, they don't vote, but we usually find out a lot of interesting information from them based on their rather unique perspectives. And not only that happened, but Karen Keene went over to the Plymouth Intermediate School and apparently was talking to some of the students there, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, they said, we understand you have high school students going to the Board of Health, how about us? So I don't think you should underestimate the enormous amount of interest and services that you could get 
from the school age students. They're motivated, um, they're interested. You have to make it available to them. The Yellow Tour project comes to mind. It was very recent. It was organized mostly, I guess, by Cal and by um, the schools. And it was a group that wanted to do something about raising awareness about suicide. And it was, I think, fairly well attended. And it was quite impressive. And again, this was something that the students got massively involved in because they see this going on in their own populations. It's not just a problem with seniors. Absolutely. I think the, the power of service and volunteering as a way of uniting generations is huge. And there's a lot of examples of how that, how that might work. And the ones you raised were, hu were really um, well said. And I think, yeah, I think it comes down to, it comes back to, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, people, it's about people want to be asked to, to participate, right? The, the kids, the seniors, you know, there's some of us who are willing to raise our hands and say, I, I'll do that. I want to get involved. But there's a lot of folks who um, would love to be involved, but they don't know how or they don't know where or they're not sure. And if somebody they know says, hey, would you, you know, come and participate in this event, they would be happy to do it. Um, so I think that that I'm, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on that invitation or that ask and um, because I think that's a powerful way of getting people to kind of growing, growing the folks who are um, involved. Yes. Um, when people were talking about memory care centers, it jogged my memory <laughs> about when we lived in New Jersey, there were memory care facilities that were houses in the communities. Mm -hmm. They were owned and run by, run by companies for profit, I would assume, but it was a group home concept like group homes for disabled adults. And it was actually in the community, a house that looked like the rest of the houses in the community. Um, and that's something to think about too in terms of the village concept. Yeah. You know, instead of having a um, kind of large center or a center type of thing that's way out in the middle of nowhere, it needs to be part of where everyone lives. Yeah, yeah that's a great example. And I am also imagining all the efficiencies with the workforce um, if they're, you know, having you know, six or eight of their, I'm thinking of home care in particular, instead of driving to six or eight homes to provide home care, they're in one location. Um, so I think that's a, a great idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. All right, well, I'm gonna give you a minute. Um, I'm gonna do a last call for comments and questions, but before I do that, I just wanted to um, make you all aware of the uh, final two forums that are being held. One will be, I think it's next week already, which is, uh, here we are in June. Um, that is gonna be an entirely virtual forum. So um, if you know anyone who's not here today who you think might be interested in participating, um, you can find that information, I think, in a number of places, but that'll be entirely on Zoom. And then we have um, the last in-person forum, which will be on Tuesday, June 13th at the library. And uh, that's at three o'clock. So again, spread the word. You're welcome to come, be, come back um, if you have more to say. Yes. So you can just click right on it. Wonderful, wonderful. So a couple of additional forums um, happening, as, and here's the information for that. Um, and I would also um, just mention my email address is listed here. If, and any, if anyone in the room or on the Zoom or anyone who's watching this in the future um, is, has an idea or a question or a thought, you're welcome to send it directly to me and I'll be sure to incorporate it into um, the materials that are going to lay the bedrock of this initiative. So I just wanted to make sure that anyone, especially those who are watching it in the future, I'm imagining maybe they catch it on PAC TV and they think, oh, I have a great idea or uh, something to say. Um, I want them to be able to, to participate. So feel free to send it to me um, in an email.